Hello, and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is David A. Simon, Project Researcher at the Hankin School of Economics and Visiting Assistant Professor of Law at the University of Kansas School of Law. We will discuss his article, Analogies in IP Moral Rights, which will be published in the Yale Journal of Law and Technology. So welcome to the podcast, David. Hey, Brian. Thanks for having me. My my pleasure. As you know, this is a subject near and dear to my heart, yes. and um, I really enjoyed reading your article several times now, as, as you know, and I'm really looking forward to, to talking with you about it because I think you ha- share a really interesting and um, I think nicely sort of teased out way of thinking about analogical thinking in, in the context of of intellectual property, but but for reader for listeners who might not be uh, as familiar with intellectual property doctrine and with copyright doctrine in, in particular, I wonder if you could say a little something about sort of what the concept of moral rights means in relation to copyright law, and, and what makes it a kind of special subcategory of rights within the kind of the the subject of copyright. Sure, copyright law generally protects author's economic rights, so the rights to exploit works for money, books, music, paintings, and so on. And within that field, there's a subcategory of rights called moral rights. And the general idea of moral rights is that they protect non-economic interests of the author. Maybe some background might be helpful to kind of situate where moral rights came from. Uh, in the 18th, mid 18th, uh, sorry, mid 19th and uh, early 20th century, uh, during the course of the Industrial Revolution, scholars became concerned, legal scholars became concerned that the economic model of law was subsuming the human element. And so some scholars wanted to reinvigorate law, and in, in this case, copyright law, with this human element. And so Instead of treating authors as purveyors of economic goods, the idea was to treat authors as human beings. And in doing that, it was felt that authors should have special rights relative to works that enable them to control the works in certain ways, to control what third parties did with the works. And the underlying basis for this claim was that the authors had some kind of a special relationship with their work by virtue of creating it. And this is the general thrust of what motivated me to think about this issue. And actually, this article is kind of situated within uh, a larger project looking at that philosophical idea. So um, some of the arguments in favor of this special relationship are based on analogies, and that's kind of the way in. Um, for this paper. Mm. So correct me if I'm wrong, but it it seems like analogies and analogical reasoning play a role in relation to moral rights and copyright that's more substantial or somehow different than the role that analogy plays in relation to the kind of economic copyright interest that you were talking about earlier. Is that right? I think that's probably fair. Um, the The economic interests are are focused more on uh, uh, an economic theory model. Uh, I, I hesitate to call it a utilitarian model, but you know the modern conception is the welfare economic model, where um, copyright is designed to incentivize the creation of new works. So you give people an economic reason to create works and then they can exploit those works and recoup their investment costs. And um, there's really no need for um, the kinds of analogies that are present in moral rights. So moral rights isn't based on that economic theory. It's based on some, some uh, usually some other theory, although there have been a couple scholars who've examined it in an economic frame. And I think it's this difference that leads people to reach for analogies. So when one says the relationship between the author and the work is special and it's based on some unique bond that they have, people think, okay, well, what, what, what could that be like? 
And it's that question, what could that be like that leads them to think, okay, well, maybe it's like this, the kind of relationship that parents have with their children or that God has with his creations. So they're trying to find an explanation for an intuition that they have. Mm. And I think that's where the, the analogy comes in uh, with more prominence than in the economic model. Right. So I wanted to talk a little bit about analogical reasoning then, because I really kind of liked the the way that you framed like thinking about analogies in in law, especially because I think as sort of a law professor teaching law students how to be lawyers, uh, so much kind of traditionally about legal thinking and legal reasoning has been analogical reasoning. I mean, in some ways, they're almost like borderline synonyms almost in some contexts, although, of course, there are many alternative ways of, of conceptualizing, you know, how we think about legal doctrine and about about how how the law works. But but your article is actually kind of breaking down that that synonym or breaking down that equation of legal reasoning and, and analogical reasoning. I, I wonder if you could talk about that, like the relationship between analogies and the way that we think about how the law does and should work. Modern scholarship, because it's been influenced so heavily by the law and economics movement, doesn't want to rely very heavily on analogical reasoning which it views as a formalist relic of judicial science that should be cast into the dustbin of legal history. So the, the, the economist, the economic analyst wants to know what are the consequences of any given legal rule and do those consequences promote efficiency or you know, some other value that's similar to that. And the traditional formal model uh, of legal analysis was something different. It was, it was the idea that you could deduce right answers to legal problems by pulling rules from cases and uh, analogizing one case to the other. And um, in doing this, you were performing some kind of judicial science. And um, that, that model of thinking has sort of fallen away as, as quaint. And um, to say a little bit more about the analogical reasoning part of it, um, if you find cases that are similar in relevant respects, um, then you think this case is a good analog to the case that I'm working with. And therefore, the rule that's stated in that case should be applied to the case that I'm working with. And therefore, you can get you know the right kind of answer. Um, in the case that you're currently working on. Um, and this, this kind of thinking um, is, even though it's sort of a historical relic, is the, the most prominent kind of reasoning that occurs for practicing lawyers. They're always trying to figure out, is this case similar to this other case? And can I extract a rule from that case that I can apply in this case? And to do that, they compare the the facts of each case. And that process is very similar to the kind of analogical reasoning that that people do on an everyday basis, trying to figure out if um, I can use my screwdriver in, in one context and in another context because we have similar function to um, a similar problem to, to work with. Uh, so... The difference between just analogical reasoning and analogical reasoning in law is some scholars think that analogical reasoning in law is constrained by precedent. And so if there's a precedent that presents an analog case, that you have to use that precedent to um, decide the case in front of you. And um, this is somewhat different from how analogical reasoning is used in in other fields, like in science. So in science, um, talking about the theoretical sciences, analogies aren't used to deduce right answers. They're used to come up with potential lines of inquiry that can be tested against uh, observation and experiment. So um, 
one common one, one example of this is uh, Isaac Newton was when he was working on uh, the color spectrum. He said, "Well, maybe the color spectrum is like the uh, seven-note diatonic scale in music." And uh, he didn't say, "Therefore, the color spectrum is like this," or look at the relevant properties and say, "Okay, it's close enough." What he did was conduct a series of uh, experiments and and was able to either you know was able to confirm his and revise his initial uh, analogy to conform to the evidence. And that kind of thing doesn't happen in law. Um, there's no similar evidentiary constraint or observational constraint. Mm. Uh, and so the in the paper, I try to set up the difference between these two to show that even in the sciences where you have some measure of testing hypotheses, even there, analogical reasoning really isn't used to deduce right answers. And so if we're thinking about in law, um, especially in the context of moral rights, where we're trying to get at the fundamental philosophical basis for the rights, we really shouldn't expect analogies to do any more than they do in the theoretical sciences. Yeah. And that's what really struck me is that it seems like we sort of almost unconsciously as lawyers use analogical reasoning in these two different ways. And the sort of traditional way, the precedential way we think about it is like, it's about promoting some form of predictability. Like if it's a similar situation, we want to expect it to come out a similar way. And, you know, the facts may change here and there, but we can say, well, you know, contextually speaking, if you have a kind of a good sense of what, what facts are driving outcomes, then you can sort of predict the other, like in, the, in the sort of the, the sort of Holmesian you know, prediction sense of, of the law. But when we, when we use analogies in the context of moral rights and in copyright, it seems like we are thinking about it in a much kind of more normative, like how does the analogy help us better understand what it's trying to do? And that seems like a very different kind of project. That's right. And the, the project, the difference between the two, the, the analogical reasoning in law and just analogical reasoning in general has to do with the ends. So in this case, we're concerned with, um, does the analogy shed light on the underlying philosophical claim? Not does one case is, is one case an analog to the case in front of us? I will say the reason that I wanted to talk about analogical reasoning in the law versus the sciences too. Another reason I wanted to talk about the difference between the two, <clears throat> um, is that moral rights are legal rights. So, um, one thing that happens when uh, legal scholars talk about legal rights is they tend to do um, the the legal analogical reasoning that we we talked about a little bit just a minute ago, and this is also true in moral rights. But um, when scholars talk about the analogies that might help to help us understand why the authors have special relations with their work. Um, they have implicit legal characteristics, like the parent. The one of the reasons the parent-child analogy might help us explain the author-work relation is because of the legal obligations that currently attach to parents, children, and third parties. So there, the 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 legal dimension here um, is not just. The legal rights, but the the analogies themselves contain uh, legal elements, and I felt like because um, because the the analogies contain these legal elements themselves, that analogical reasoning would uh, also be an appropriate uh, means to explore them. So maybe you could spend a little time, like breaking one of those down. I mean the 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 analogy you spend the most time on in the paper is the parent child relationship. And you sort of examine that relationship, its application in a moral rights context. And then you, you, you analyze whether or not the, the sort of analogy is a helpful one in terms of understanding why and how moral rights might or might not uh, be justified in a, in a copyright context. Maybe you could kind of walk us through a little bit how, how you think that ought to work, because I, I thought that was a really kind of interesting and illuminating move. Sure. The, the parent-child analogy 
is currently the most popular analogy to explain the relation between the author and the work. And there were a couple of interesting places where it came up. So one that caught my attention when I first started working on this was J.K. Rowling, who is the author of Harry Potter books, of which I, you know, I can say I've never actually read one. Um, but <laughs> She, you, 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 and me both. Yeah. So, what's amazing to me is when authors gain prominence, how emboldened they feel to assert their rights. And she had a quote where she said something like, "Someone was using a, a portion of her work or wanted to use a portion of her work," and she said, "Well, it's my baby, and I can kind of do whatever I want with it. I can take it out and play with it whenever I want. I can keep it inside." And I just thought that was sort of biz- a bizarre way to to draw the analogy in, and then. Um, there were some other <clears throat> instances where the analogy came up, like um, at one point the United States was considering a droit de suite, which is essentially a resale royalty on certain kinds of uh, copyrighted works. And um, in the in the congressional uh, report, the, the, the legislative history, no, not the legislative history, but the congressional um, hearings on the subject – one of the uh, proponents said that the droit de suite would act as an, an economic umbilical cord to the author. And what was really interesting about that was it drew on the parent-child analogy, but explicitly in terms of uh, economics, which is kind of the opposite of why the parent-child analogy is typically used. So so those were some examples that drew my attention to the analogy. But um, just to say a little bit of, about why... Uh, I think the analogy falls apart. Um, what I tried to do in each one of the cases of these analogies, the parent-child analogy, the God-creature analogy, uh, the Lord-Vassal-Fife analogy, um, and the master-slave analogy was to pick apart the, the premises of each analogy and see if they held up to scrutiny. So in the case of the parent-child analogy, we have a, a relationship, the parent-child analogy, that presumably has some specialness attached to it. So the first question is, what is special about the parent-child relationship? And I run through um, four potential arguments about what makes the parent-child relationship special. Um, and I'll, I'll just run through them quickly, and then I'm just going to I'm just going to focus on really one aspect of why um, they tend to fall apart. So the first argument I call the from me argument. It's basically the the specialness of the relationship come is a, is a function of the child biologically coming from me. So my genetic material making up the child. And so the child is then like me. The, the second argument is the raised by me argument. It comes up, it's, it's an ancient argument. It comes up actually in the Crito uh, where Socrates basically says, look, the state raised you. We gave you all this food. We gave you this education. Now it's your turn to obey. Uh, so that's the second argument. Parents raise you. They take care of you. And therefore, you need to do what they say. The third argument is what I call the shared experiences argument. <clears throat> so it's a little bit more modern conception of the raised by me argument. It says that, well, you know, you, you go with your kids to soccer games, you take them to swimming lessons, you have all kinds of experiences that you share with them. And it's these experiences that create a bond with your child. And, and therefore, that's what's special about the relationship. And then the final, um, the final argument is the what I call the rule giver argument, which is the, the parent is the disciplinarian, they're the one who uh, makes the rules because they're looking out for your best interests. <clears throat> Um, and therefore, the special relationship is based on this rule giving function. Um, so the question then is, um, supposing these are, you know, decent arguments for why this relationship is special, how does this compare with the author work relation? And I don't want to go through all of the the arguments that I make, but fundamentally, I think the problem with this analogy is it really compares the wrong kinds of objects. So Mm. if you compare works to, 
to um, children, you're comparing inanimate objects to, to people. And so a lot of these arguments depend on the child being a moral agent, or at least someone with the capacity for free choice. And in the context of the author work relation, that's just not true. There, there is no, um, there is no uh, human being or even sentient being that is making a choice. What you're doing is you're trying to uh, analogize <clears throat> the relation between the author and the work to uh, the parent and the child and impose duties on third parties. Um, but in the context of the parent and the, I'm sorry, in the author and the work, um, the relationship isn't between two human beings. It's between a human being and an inanimate object. And what you're really trying to do is uh, argue for impositions or restrictions on third parties' ability to use that inanimate object. So if it's true that um, parents share this special relationship with their child, for example, uh, by sharing experiences with them, it's really kind of hard to see how that might be true for authors and their works in the same kind of way, because the work isn't really, it, work isn't having an experience. It's not going to a soccer game. It's not, it's not swimming. It's, it's just an inanimate object. Um, and so the, the analogy seems to kind of break down mm. and that, that's true for all of these, these arguments that I provide. Yeah. 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 Well, in the case of the parent child one in particular, I mean, it struck me like two different things struck me, you know, in relation to the, the, I find quite convincing points that you make. I mean, one is that, as you say, right. I mean, parents don't just own or control their children. They, they have obligations to, to their children. I mean, they owe something to their child and like their ability to exercise kind of dictatorial con control is delimited in, in all manner of of different ways, and I guess especially now that you were you were just kind of describing the way the analogy breaks down, it it struck me that if we want to use that parent child relationship, it's almost like a stronger analogy for thinking about the relationship between an original author and a subsequent author of a related work. Right, and and actually that that point, that last point you made just raises another question about the value of the analogy, because if it's true that the author is the parent and the work is the child, then how do you ever get new people? Uh, because like the, the works themselves aren't then growing up and then creating authors who then produce works. It's right. It's the authors that are using other authors works to create new works. So there's kind of a defect there and, in the analogy and it, it makes it, it just makes the analogy seem to, um, it exposes what I think is a weakness of the analogy. And then to the other point you made about, uh, legal obligations. So one of the things that I try to do other, other than running through these arguments and how they don't really map on from parent child to author work is look at what, um, legal protections <clears throat> might follow from one analogy to the other. And, as you rightly pointed out, um, we think of the parent-child analogy as creating not just um, not just a special relationship, but but duties and obligations on behalf of parents to look after their children, to take care of them, um, and frequently the moral rights advocates will say, "Yeah, that's exactly the point, right?" Um, we want to give authors the rights to to take care of their, you know, their spiritual children or whatever they call them. And what is often unnoticed is that this also means that authors should have obligations to intervene. Uh, so moral rights on this on this picture shouldn't just be permissive. It shouldn't be I can take my baby out and play with it whenever I want. It should be you have to intervene no matter what in certain cases. And that's just not something that moral rights in whatever conception um, are thought to thought to do or even should do. And a related point is that, you know, we're drawing on this analogy of the parent child and what goes unnoticed is that this relationship has changed quite significantly. 
uh, over human history. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that children were treated as property of the parents. And, you know, parents could beat them. And in fact, in some states in the United States, it's still permissible for for parents to uh, physically discipline their children. Um, so we need to ask, what, which parent-child relationship are we analogizing to? Is it the current progressive parent-child relationship or is it the one from 1500? Mm-hmm. Um, and that point that the the parent-child relationship is culturally contingent and the, the values that underpin it are culturally and historically contingent should give us pause about what we think the analogy can show. And it, to me, it indicates that what it's really doing is trying to capitalize on some modern intuition we have and then leverage that intuition to argue for something that is totally different. Yeah, I was wondering if you could dig a little bit into that last point, because for me, this is a really interesting aspect of of what you're doing in this paper. I mean, why is it, do you think, that for so many people, maybe even like the majority of of people, these analogies, especially the parent-child analogy, but the other ones as well, seem so natural and so obvious that they jump to them without really questioning why and and why do people find them why do people find them compelling i mean how does it structure the way that people kind of think about and normalize and and justify the kinds of claims that authors want to make in relation to their works yeah it's a complicated question because there's so many features of our current cultural understanding that might lead us to one of these analogies. I think a lot of it has to do with the the economic development of societies in the past two to 300 years <clears throat> and how pervasive the concept of property has become. And the parent-child analogy, <clears throat> um, it... It, it captures this this concept of property without actually talking about it because what people are really trying to say is that this thing is mine, right? I created it, <clears throat> excuse me, I created it and um, I can do what I want with it and they feel a connection to it, right? And so there's this mixed, there's this mixed emotional uh, and culture, psychological feeling that they have towards the work. At one time, it's theirs, and they want to, you know, maybe make money from it or whatever. On the other hand, in some cases, they feel like they really do invest part of their own mental makeup or their own self or their own soul or whatever they call it in the work, and so they feel this connection with it. Um, <clears throat> so there's this mix of feelings that people have and it's it's easy to see how someone can go from it came from my hand to it came from me you know i i did it just like just like the way i made a child my child resembles me this painting resembles me mm. even though that's you know that's not true in a lot of cases people are in fine arts expressing certain thoughts and feelings that they have. And maybe they are in some sense sharing an experience they have through the work. So the, the intuitive appeal of making something that looks like me and um, me being the parent of something that looks like me, I just think that there's a natural connection there. Um, and it and it's also just convenient for people who feel I, personally i think it's people think that some people just feel that they have, should have a right to control what other people do other people do with their book or their movie or whatever and that feeling is um in part just something that they have but again i think goes back to some of these 
economic and cultural factors having to do with the economic development of societies and the propertization of societies and everything is somebody's property and um, conceptions about who the author is and the author is, you know, inspired creative genius, which has um, a history in copyright literature. So I think all of these ideas kind of come together and um, make the parent-child analogy just something really easy to reach for. Mm. I'll explain these complex feelings. Mm. Mm. Well, and, 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 you, and you point out in the paper, like I think the extent to which not just moral rights, but copyright in general, and maybe even sort of intellectual property rights in general seem uniquely infused with this kind, this, this particular form of analogical reasoning, this like kind of comparison of unrelated relationships in a way to try to make rhetorical claims for what's justified in an alternative, an alternative context. I mean, I wonder, like, is there something unique about copyright or intellectual property that encourages that? And, and how can and should we kind of push back in a conceptual rhetorical sense against that kind of move? I mean, I guess in kind of in closing, like, what do you think in general about sort of the way we have become conditioned to use this form of analogical reasoning in the intellectual property space? For many people who are familiar with intellectual property, I don't think it's a surprise to see Analogies from uh, analogies that are rhetorically appealing used in the service of questionable legal objectives. Um, as far as whether this is unique to, to copyright, I don't I don't think that it pro I don't think it probably is. I mean, I think we see some similar things happening in patent law with the myth of the the inventor having a, a flash of brilliance. Um, but it, and I, and I haven't done a survey of all the areas of law to know whether this is true, but there might be something <clears throat> about, um, the fact that intellectual property is typically conceived of as some kind of, uh, expression of mental thought, and certainly this was true in um, some early moral rights thinkers, particularly in France. They, they felt that the thoughts themselves were actually part of the work. You couldn't really protect them, but the thoughts themselves represented the work. And there's a way in which the mental content is the work that makes it more personal than, say, um, sanding a table. Right, because you come up with something in your head, and then that thing in your head is manifested in some tangible medium of expression, whether it's an invention or a book or a painting. And it just seems to be the case that that mental representation that was in your head is now on a piece of paper, and so there's some part of you that's wrapped up in that. And I think that that that's hard to get away from. Um, it's not hard for me personally to get away from, but I think it's hard for most people to see the difference between um, creation as something that's part of yourself and creation that is, you know, in the context of a whole bunch of other factors that may or may not cause you to do or write or paint or whatever um, and create a certain work. And there's a, there's a curious kind of, um, tension here because often authors say that they don't have control over what they produce. They say, well, I, some people say, you know, God inspired me to do X, Y, and Z to write this book. Other people say um, they, they were inspired for no reason whatsoever. I, Towns Van's aunt wrote a song called Poncho and Lefty. And he said that he wrote the song from a dream, right? And he said, I didn't, I don't think that this song, I didn't write this song. It came to me. Um, and yet at the same time, <clears throat> authors, even if they feel that way, <clears throat> feel that this personal connection is really impossible to get away from because of the way the work 
was in their head. So I don't know that we'll ever be able to get away from this picture, but I think one way to at least bring some clarity is to, to go through these analogies like I did and show they don't work exactly like you think they do. And maybe we should think about different modes of conceptualizing why authors have special rights in relation to their work. Or if there is a special bond, we should think about what's so special about the bond, not how is this bond like some other bond that we have. Mm, yeah, great. Well, David, thanks so much. It's been a pleasure talking to you about this excellent paper. Thanks, Brian. Maybe I've been teaching economics too long. We're talking to Professor Lewis Wormingler. Professor, you sound depressed. Yeah, I'm in a depression. <laughs> depression, always thinking economics, aren't you, Professor? Tell us, what's the problem? My students are the problem. They have high IQs, but they are not very interested in economics. Mm, sounds like they have low EQs, Professor. EQs? Economics quotients. Economics quotients, I like that. Professor, I have a suggestion. There's a free booklet on economics that's interesting, easy to read, and an easy way to raise your students' EQ. Oh, how do I get it? Just drop a postcard to Economics, Pueblo, Colorado, 81009. Free copies for my students also? Just have them write Economics, Pueblo, Colorado, 81009. Your booklet may solve a real economics problem. What's that, Professor? My students will start buying the $10,000 worth of economics books in the school's bookstore. A public service message of the Advertising Council and U.S. Department of Commerce, presented by this station.